my name is Song Il Wu. It's a great privilege for me to uh, introduce the last speaker of our uh, very uh, brilliant symposium. In Korean saying, there are two things. When you start something, you already established fulfilled half. It's very optimistic view. The other saying is very contradictory as far as I'm concerned. If you not if you did not finish well, it's, everything is goes wrong. So <laughs> we have a very thick and ready. So I think the Dr. Ward uh, uh, will do a last uh, the talk. The title is Molecular Seed Catalyst and Hydro Processing, the recent findings. He was uh, educated at the University of Cambridge, a PhD in physical chemistry, and he was a postdoctoral fellowship at the Alberta Research Council in Canada. And now currently he is a senior staff consultant in the Unoka Corporation. Please. First, I'd like to thank the organizing committee for this chance to uh, come to Korea and uh, talk to this uh, group. Someone like Dr. Young from uh, Yukong, I a little bit uh, well, I turned up at the right meeting or not, but uh, listening to all this uh, very detailed and uh, exciting uh, study on the surface of catalysts and the reactions. However, I've seen Dr. Young's pictures of the dynamometers and buttons and things, I felt somewhat more at home. Stage it on. Lift it up. Lift it up. Okay. Um, try to some now. Now. You might join us easier. You have to mute on. Okay. It's okay. <laughs> well, yes, I have to mute on. So I also say while I'm here that. Uh, I should apologize too for my language. I'm probably the only native English man in the room, but having spent uh, quite a few years in the United States, uh, when I go back to England, they tell me I speak a different language. <laughs> <laughs> Try to structure this talk around uh, some observations we've made in our laboratory on uh, hydroprocessing, mainly over molecular synthesis like catalysts. Uh, uh, we think we know what we're doing, what, uh, how we're doing it, or detailed interpretation of uh, what the materials are doing uh, don't always understand and thought it might be worth throwing out some of the challenges to people here. Finding myself in the an environmental session, I thought we should how does this work? I thought I'd put down some reasons but we've sort of challenges we see in the environmental area, at least from our company, which are a little bit different to other people, but a lot of overlap. I think the last several people have uh, shown the, talked about the importance of sulfur removal uh, for emissions control. This is both from effects in the gas phase areas, like emissions out of cat crackers, and also effects in diesel fuels, etc. Problems of NLX are well known and a source of great problems. Alkylations in area which are the factors at the moment uh, were, were trying to get away from sulfuric acid, hydrogen fluoride catalysts over solid state catalysts for pollution control and disposal problems. Alkylation, here I'm referring to aromatics, alkylation, benzene in particular, we're, I think we're in pretty good shape now. That we've got away from uh, Aluminum chloride and uh, phosphoric acid, and these are being replaced now by uh, mobile processes using ZSM5 catalysts and the system out of uh, our laboratory on Lummis, which uses a modified YZ like catalyst for producing ethyl benzene and cumin. Blue oil production, similarly, we're getting away from uh, treating with solvents and uh, clays and using. Uh, shape selective catalyst for uh, de-waxing and improving pore point properties. <laughs> Top two areas are areas we're having a lot of trouble and I'm hoping to use that to lead into my talk.
Here's some of the future specification for gasoline. The carb, carb 2 is the California Air Resources Board number 2 type proposal, which is probably the most severe in the world at the moment compared to current gasoline. See so a problem with the lowering the vapor pressure, which controls amounts of light materials such as C4 and C5 to put into gasoline. <coughs> We're having to reduce the aromatics substantially, roughly by 50%. All the things have to be reduced roughly 50%. We're being forced to put oxygenates into gasoline, methanol, MTBE by legislation. Although modern automobiles have shown that there's absolutely no positive effect from putting these materials. They all have uh, oxygen sensors on which control the air-fuel ratio. Two of the most critical problems for us is reducing the endpoint of the gasoline from 365 degrees centigrade to 290 degrees. We have a 70 or so degrees boiling point material which we really don't know what to do with. We've lost gasoline volume. Similarly, the T90 actually means the, it's the boiling point at which 90% of the product boils. Similarly, the T50 point or the point at which 50% of the product boiled is also being customized. Sulfur is having to be reduced by from 300 to 30% and also benzene will have to be controlled. These are all formidable problems. This next slide will not go through in detail shows some of the changes in the product from a hydrocracker on changing the end point of gasoline from 390 degrees up to 270. In the type of graph here, this should be 22. But you see the vast increase in the amount of butanes produced, increase in pentanes, and let's sort of go to the bottom line. We reduce the volume of gasoline from 112 to 106 percent particularly heavier gasoline from 84 to 55 percent. These are formidable problems how we customize around this type of situation. Similarly, in the diesel area, nationwide, uh, being forced to reduce the sulfur in diesel fuel to 500 parts per m per million. In California, starting this fall actually, we've been forced to reduce the aromatics content to 10 weight percent. All these are good moves environmentally, but from an industrial point of view, they're very difficult. As you can see, $2.60 per pound of pollutant removed and it cost us roughly six to ten cents per gallon to do this. What I'd like to do now is to move into the area of hydro processing, which is possibly one way where we can engineer and do catalysis to get around some of these problems. I want particular to talk about hydrocracking catalysts, which uh, many of you know are bifunctional catalysts that consist of a hydrogenation component, noble metal or non-noble metal, mounted on a cracking component support. The catalyst supports can be usually structured into three areas, total amorphous oxides, uh, essentially all zeolite, zeolite or a mixture of oxide and zeolite. I'm going to talk mainly about these two areas. First part of this talk will be on hydrogenation components. Just admit if I'm clumsy here, this is the first time I've given a talk with view graphs. I usually use slides. So. <laughs> Look in the literature, the amount of information on the uh, hydrogenation component and the cracking component in hydrocracking colors is very slim. This about summarizes it. You could increase in the hydrogenation power, you go from little molybdenum by little tungsten to platinum palladium. And for the acidic function, you go from alumina to fluoride alumina, silica alumina, and zeolites. 
I don't understand a little bit how I'm going to present this talk. I'm going to show you a couple of flow diagrams of the modern commercial hydrocarbon. This is the only engineering. The last of the talk is uh, chemistry. I'm a chemist and modern engineer. Now we introduce the feedstock to a hydrotreating catalyst, a typical little molybdenum phosphorus containing catalyst supported on alumina, some of those covered in the previous talks. Well, the function is to remove the organic nitrogen and organic sulfur compounds, convert them into hydrogen sulfide and ammonia, either then pass through the cracking reactor and go through separation. This reactor usually runs at about 70% conversion. And the reason I'm showing it here is that at this point, entering the cracking reactor, you have a feedstock which contains substantial amounts of hydrogen sulfide and ammonia. So the catalyst is always operating in this atmosphere. A modification of this process adds a second reactor and for simplicity takes the product uh, from the first reactor which hasn't been converted into lighter boiling materials passes through a second reactor. The difference in this reactor is the ammonia has been removed from the system so the catalyst is operating only in the presence of hydrogen sulfide. <laughs> Right now to talk something about the noble metal hydrogenation components. And to split this into several sections. One, the effect of reduction conditions, effect of nitrogen gas, nitrogen oxygen, rare earths, and the reactivation studies. What type of catalyst are we using in the systems? We're using, in both cases, a study of starting with a sodium zeolite, which is ion exchange, and about 2% sodium, steam calcined, followed by further ammonium ion exchange, and palladium ions are introduced into this. That's made into finished catalyst and it's calcined. That stage is put into the hydrocracking reactor. In which it is activated in the presence of hydrogen. And what we can see in this slide is that how it's activated is uh, critical to its performance. Give you a relative idea, these are meant measured versus a base point. And each 20, 25 degrees change in activity represents a doubling of the activity or a halving of the activity. Now if we look on this slide and, and compare effects of temperature and time, pick out the runs at the same temperature, there was variation from 650 degrees to 700, 800, up to 850. What we can see is by activating for six hours that have a maximum activity, which is measuring the minimum decline in operating temperature. For activation at six hours, or about 700 to 800 degrees. Activation at higher or lower temperature reduces the activity. If we do this for a shorter time, but two hours at 800 degrees, we see virtually no effect. But if we do two hours at 700 degrees, the catalyst is a significantly less active. So we conclude from this there's something happening in the reduction of the catalyst system. At these temperatures it's obvious that the catalyst is already well reduced, but there's probably some restructuring, agglomerate, minor agglomeration, or maybe even a redistribution in the zeolite system. Somewhat more confusing to us, as if we take the catalyst in the oxide form and place it in the catalytic reactor and heat the catalyst in the presence of nitrogen at 200 pounds PSIG pressure at different temperature, we see a startling decrease in the activity. The activity decrease gets up to over 120 degrees when it's heated for 400 degrees F for about six hours. 
this phenomenon does not occur in helium. It does not occur if the catalyst goes from the oxide form directly to the reduced form, treated with hydrogen. What we have discovered, taking some of the data off there, we take the palladium catalyst, shown treated with nitrogen, 18, at this time at 1800 pounds pressure, 400 degrees F, it loses 120 degrees in activity. And then, when reduced with hydrogen and running a test reactor, and then take that same catalyst and retreat it with 1% oxygen, 200 pounds, 860 degrees F, which is around 460 degrees centigrade, two hours, followed by a further treatment. The catalyst uh, reactivates to within 17 degrees of the original catalyst. What's happening here, we've no idea. So, some effect of the nitrogen must be moving around the palladium in this catalyst system, and whatever damage is done can be restored by mild oxygen treatment. Another problem we run into with this type of catalyst that if we make the catalyst as we described initially, we evaluate in a test reactor in you know, temperature of roughly 500 degrees, 510 degrees for a given conversion. We then take the catalyst, burn off the carbon, we generate it, deactivates to 540 degrees, which is, loses more than half of its activity. However, if we put raw earth into this catalyst in the early stage during the synthesis, we get the same initial activity, and its activity after regeneration remains the same. Now, this is something similar to what Gary Haller's reporting is. She won't call the upper chair. <laughs> so there's a uh, platinum, uh, uh, nickel, uh, alveolite catalyst. And all that feels happening here is that. Uh, this happens also with magnesium, is that the multivalent cation is moving into the small cage in the zeolite structure, blocks them, and the palladium exchange of the catalyst is only is restricted to go into the super cages where it's available to reactive molecules. As we mentioned, previous during use, these catalysts will deactivate due to carbon deposition. They also become steamed. That shouldn't be cast on a secretary was thinking about somebody else. It's the steam which results in cation migration and also palladium agglomeration. Now we can restore the activity of these catalysts by taking out the metal cations and redistributing the palladium. We'll show that on the Next slide. Here we've gone through a series of uh, procedures. So we've taken a catalyst which was stabilized in this case either with magnesium or rare earth ions. See, I measure the activity of the fresh catalyst to about 550 degrees. After regeneration, deactivated 610, which is 60 degrees, or down to about less than 20% of its initial activity. We treat that catalyst then with uh, ammonia gas, which has been preceded by water, or with aqueous ammonium hydroxide. We can restore the activity to essentially the fresh catalyst activity. If we treat it with ammonium nitrate, we can restore the activity to within 10 degrees of the fresh catalyst. And if we treat it with a mixture either simultaneously or sequentially with ammonium hydroxide and ammonium nitrate, we actually improve the catalyst activity. Here we think we know a little bit what's happening. These catalysts the illustrator were made by sodium ion exchange, which at this 
time was limited in commercial to about 1.5% sodium oxide. Then exchange magnesium in for stability and followed by palladium. What happens during uh, use in a commercial unit is that in the presence of steam, hydrogen sulfide, the both the palladium and the sodium migrate. The sodium ions migrate from, uh, into super cages where they uh, damage the catalyst uh, acidity and therefore its cracking activity. We can restore that activity by simply ammonium ion exchange with sodium out. Similarly, the palladium has migrated, and we can restore that activity by treating with ammonium hydroxide, which reforms palladium tetramine solution, which uh, then re-exchanges into the zeolite and ion exchange positions. So, pitch I want to leave with you that uh, many commercial uh, molecular sieve catalysts, which uh, Noble metal in them. The noble metal is in a very delicate, fragile state and uh, can uh, lose its performance readily. I'm going to pass on for a few minutes to the, uh, the base of the catalyst, the hydrogenation activity, <coughs> the, the acidic activity. And here I'm going to talk about two major areas. The Treatment, hydrothermal treatment of ammonium ion to why to stabilize it and remove sodium. This can be uh, sequentially or separ separately treated chemically to change the silicon to alumina ratio uh, by silicon enrichment or by acid treatment to remove alumina out of the structure. So many changes which occur there. One of the most dramatic changes is that uh, there's a big change in the foci distribution. Zeolites are often regarded as having a uniform foci distribution around about eight, eight angstroms. And this is completely true for as received uh, sodium Y or various other materials. As soon as one treats these in a hydrothermal atmosphere, one uh, removes aluminum ions from the structure and one produces a uh, mesopore region which uh, usually centers around about 100 angstroms. The more one steams a zeolite, the more uh, this uh, volume of uh, pores in a, a large pore diameter increase. And to give you an illustration, this is uh, roughly five times the size of the pores which are in the now famous uh, VPI-5 uh, zeolite, the other pores are around 20 angstroms. This next slide illustrates that in a bar graph area where the black bars are relatively mild steaming, you can see introduced pores around 40 to 80 angstroms and some around 140, 160. More severe steaming at 770 degrees, you increase the amount of pores all through the spectrum as you delumanize the structure more substantially. Bring about these changes just quite a bit in the catalytic area. Increasing the steaming. Decre removes alumina from the structure and changes the unit cell parameter of the structure, decreases. And here you can see the effect of the temperature for a given feedstock conversion as one decreases the unit cell from 24.55, which is that of a normal ultra stable Y zeolite, down to 3.5, down to 3.0, which most people in the zeolite areas. Uh, uh, union carbide or UOP LZ 10 type material. Uh, got a relatively smooth curve, but well, the, the activity decreasing as the unit cell constant is decreased. And a roughly parallel curve for tungsten instead of molybdenum containing catalysts. These changes uh, also change the product formed, and I can see going in smaller unit cell, one increases the volume of the product which 
filed in 300 to 700 degree fraction, which is typically uh, the middle distillate uh, diesel jet fuel range. Uh, decrease in the style increases the amount of this uh, uh, higher boiling product. Also, tungsten gives roughly similar uh, yields, uh, slightly lower. Now the change to slightly different subject. And here's a comparison. We were trying to reformulate the gasoline to uh, meet more modern blends and illustrates three catalysts which are all similar or little tungsten based but using YZ light, which would be uh, ultra stable YZ light, the uh, Union Carbide Y82. LZ210 Z light, which is the Y zeolite which has been modified by treatment with ammonium silica fluoride which removes alumina from the lattice and inserts silicon into place and the beta zeolite and one can see dramatically the difference in operating temperature for the same conversion over 100 degrees different between the beta and the two Y zeolites is run at 80% conversion to 700 minus product with the beta zeolite one sees the one sees substantial amount more of uh, light gases, the C3, C2, C1s formed, substantially more uh, butane. The ratio of the isobutane to normal butane remains roughly the same. The ratio of the, the more uh, pentane formed, the ratio of the iso to normal pentane uh, decreases. And more important, the yield of uh, liquids between C6 and 700 degrees changes dramatically. <coughs> Next slide shows what happens to heavier normal paraffins over two different catalysts. The green curve is the feedstock entering the reactor for C12 to C30 hydrocarbons. Which has a total weight percent of 14, these are normal paraffins, 14.5 weight percent. If we process it over a YZ like catalyst in the presence of ammonia, we reduce the total of uh, normal paraffins to 8.4, and YZ light in the absence of ammonia reduce it to about 4.1 weight percent. If we use beta Z light instead, we uh, pr produce much less. Uh, normal paraffins compared to the Y zeolite are total is down to 1.2 in one case and 0 0.4 in the other case. So there's something fundamentally different going on in the cracking mechanism in these zeolites. Uh, we had a couple of guesses what it is and we feel there might be some in, uh, illustration in the structure. This is a taken from the atlas of molecular sieves. For Y zeolite, the average pore diameter is around 7.4 angstroms. We go over to the shape selective catalyst, uh, ZSM5. You see that the average pore diameter is much less restricted, roughly 5.5 uh, meter direction. We know this catalyst type of zeolite structure is uh, specific for cracking normal paraffins but uh, rejecting larger molecules. If we look at the beta zeolite structure, we see that the pore structure in one direction along the 1, 0, 0 axis is roughly the same as ZSM5, 5.5 by 5.5. Along the 0, 0, 1 axis, the pore opening is 7.6 by 6.4, which is close to that of uh, Y0. So, uh, as an amateurish explanation, we feel that the beta zeolite is handling uh, normal paraffins because it's uh, structured along the 1100 axis, very much like ZSM5 would do, where the Y zeolite behaves like the larger port catalyst. Right, uh, a couple of moments. Yeah. Uh, 
We mentioned earlier that one could modify molecular sieves by treating with ammonium silica fluoride. And what we see here is we increase the silica to alumina ratio of the zeolite by treatment with silica fluoride, starting with the Y zeolite, which is around 5.6 up to 12. That the catalytic activity is a negative degree, so it's the higher up, the more active the catalyst is. Catalytic activity increases roughly linear with the increase in the silica to alumina ratio of the zeolite. So although we're decreasing the amount of alumina in the structure, and therefore probably the number of acid sites, we are effectively increasing the cracking activity by some means which we do not understand. can also change the silica to luma ratio by treatment with acid. Here's what happens when one treats an LZ10 catalyst, which is a double steamed y zeolite with acid. The nominal silica to luma ratio will be about 5.6 get an activity of 760 degrees, the selector of the diesel fuel rate to 3%. We remove the alumina out of that by acid extraction. You can see that we either to a ratio of 8 or 11, we improve the activity by 10 degrees or so, and significantly 5% increase the selectivity. If we go too far up to 61, so that the alumina ratio of the catalyst is sent by 10 degrees or so, and significantly 5% increase the selectivity. If we go too far up to 61, so the alumina ratio of the catalyst is essentially inactive. So by changing the silica alumina ratio, we're able to tailor the activity and also, more importantly, the uh, diesel efficiency to a higher amount. And I think with that, I'd like to conclude. My, uh, the hydrogenation components of the dual functional catalyst, where the activation time and temperature are important in obtaining maximum activity. The atmosphere in which they're treated after uh, Preparation, whether directly reduced or treated with nitrogen or other gases, is also important. The catalyst base composition is important, whether they have rare earth or magnesium or some other multivalent cation to stabilize the structure. One can reactivate these catalysts after deactivation by treatment with uh, ammonia or, and uh, ammonium ions. The, Cracking component of the zeolite is influenced by the amount of zeolite and the type of zeolite. The unit cell parameter is an important parameter. Zeolite silica alumina ratio is important. And I did go into it in a lack of time. The ratio of the zeolite to amorphous components in the catalyst, and particularly whether the amorphous component is alumina or silica alumina or pillar clay or sepulite or anything of several other materials. Thank you. Now this door is open for comments or questions. that the uh, catalytic activity uh, is strongly dependent on the uh, unicell parameter, but uh, the change in the unicell parameter was very small. I know. Although the change is very small, you showed 
very dramatic catalytic activity changing. And I wonder why it's, it could be due to the uh, presence of large pore within the zeolite crystal instead of the, uh, the actual changes in the unicell parameters. Might be uh, the, the changes in the catalytic activity, I mean, uh, can come from the uh, other effects rather than the uh, small increase in the, the unicell parameters. How do you think about that? Well, the actual change in the unicell parameter showed from roughly 24.6 to 24.3 are large. Uh, principle, normal sodium YZ like the unit cell parameter is around 24.6, 24.58. If one completely de-illuminates de the zeolite or takes a quartz, for instance, the unit cell parameter is down around 24.28, something like that. So the scale is compressed, but in terms of composition, it's, uh, you can go through large changes. Uh, the catalytic activity may change due to the silicon to aluminum ratio, right. and the, uh, because of the silicon to aluminum ratio, the, uh, the unicell parameter changes. Oh. So the uh, catalytic activity right. uh, can be plotted as a function of the unicell parameter, right. but the, uh, the indeed, uh, in fact, the changes in the unicell parameter may affect very little in the uh, change can other effects. I don't know. Well, I, mean, I, I agree with you. They, these are very complicated <coughs> systems and one has uh, a number of things going at the same time. Uh, for instance, one can obtain the same unit cell parameter by several different means. Yeah. And uh, so that's not an absolute catch. I was hoping to have a one slide and the data wasn't available that showing where uh, one could uh, of a certain unit cell parameter and change the silicon to aluminum ratio by taking that material and leaching with acid from a, that's an LZ10 material from a silicon to aluminum ratio of about 5.8. Treat it with acid and up to a ratio of silicon to aluminum of 12 without changing the unit cell parameter and you can change the catalytic activity. The unit cell parameter is mainly determined by how much hydrothermal treatment the zeolite has. Um, has anybody ever tried this uh, palladium hexagonal posicide? Do you have any idea? Because hexagonal posicide is um, more widely open. There is some isolated data from mobile on the palladium and hexagonal posicide, but it's uh, not detailed enough to uh, make comparative conclusions. Uh, the pattern data saying it works for hydrogenation. And uh, we haven't gone as far to synthesize some ourselves to make a, a comparable data. Is there any other salt? Mike, you mentioned the, you can reduce the. Yes by using the high pressure uh, nitrogen, right? Well, we do something to it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Regarding that point, uh, did you measure or uh, catalyze the state of nitrogen in a palladium state? Did you find some complexation of palladium and nitrogen at high pressure or at temperatures? We never looked for it. Uh, we looked at the X-ray diffraction and electron microscopy. And uh, without making a long production out of it, we saw there were changes in the size and the positions of the palladium. We did not look at any, if there was any specific palladium nitrogen uh, bonding or interaction. You can the operating point and the pressure and temperature slave. Did you make some uh, range of the temperature and pressure? Did you check that? We well, checked it from the activity point of view. Yeah. We, we did not do uh, uh, gravimetric absorption experiments. We actually, I threw this data out that somebody in the academic world might be interested in finding out what this phenomenon is. We really don't have time to do it. We found a solution to it, so we moved on. <laughs> <laughs> the solution was treat the catalyst with some oxygen.
Okay, you you finished the taking picture? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for Dr. Ward.